Greetings and salutations, I'm Keb. Welcome back to this little let's play of 80 days, where we are approaching Madras in India. At Madras, they pushed the young girl from the train down a ramp, and she waved up at me before turning to face the road ahead. Under the weight of our cases, I could not wave back, and then she was gone. You are fortunate I had the sense to call the guard, Monsieur Fogg remarked coolly. You are too easily cozened by a winning smile. And so goes the... our relations go down again, sadly. No departure today. Okay, fine, so there's nothing we can do. Valuable in Chittagong. Well, I am gonna go there if I can. Manila. Well, that's only somewhat valuable, not really valuable. We're not gonna go through deserts anymore, so I can get rid of this, but at least. We aren't going to go through dusty roads, I don't need that. Uh, very valuable in Manila. Um, that's, a that's a large set. You know what, let's take the large set. And a block. And I'm going to shuffle these items. If I were to throw something away right now, it's going to be the, whist the rail whistle. Because we're going to be traveling by sea for, for a while now. I suppose we could go with the items? Nah. I think we're okay now. Let's explore. And find more routes. Okay, a route to Voltaire and to Calcutta. Madras was a city within a city. Inside the walls and fortifications of Fort St. George was White Town, where British memsahibs and factors, and factors traded and went to church and traveled from place to place in mechanical palanquins. Um, outside the walls was the glorified shanty of Black Town, where Indian servants and laborers and clerks made their homes. Uh, I ventured into Black Town, where I attracted a few glances, but no real attention. No doubt there were many reasons for a lone foreigner to wander the cramped streets and back alleys. But after a few minutes, I realized I was being stalked. I turned to face my shadow, to find myself face to face with a nun. Would you like a blessing, good sir? An ornate gold cross hung heavily from her, from her neck. <laughs> Uh, yes, sister. Her smile spore out the racers, and with no further warning, she brought her heavily, heavy gold cross down on my head with a crack. <laughs> my vision sputtered and sparkle spark sparked into blackness. That's some blessing. When I awoke, I was in a nunnery. My nun assailant offered me a cool cloth. I am Sister Panim Panimalar. And this is the convent of the Sisters of Didacus. Oh my. <laughs> what is a Didacus? Didacus is a Spartan a Spanish saint who died in 1463. King Philip, King Philip II commissioned a clockwork automaton of Didacus, which could pray. The first automaton man, man of uh, the first automaton man of God, but not the last. She took a breath. My order does not believe, as the Pope does that automatons are abominations. We believe that machines, too, are capable of grace. Oh my. You believe automatons have souls? Don't you? She twinkled, an almost unknown-like expression. Building an automaton is like raising a child. They are shaped in our image as we are in God's. Those blasphemers of the Artificers Guild know nothing of God, and so their creations are godless. And you want godly machines? I asked carefully. In church on Sunday, following the commandments, all that. The Dedation sisters are dedicated to the search for a machine which has a soul. And now we require for your help in our search. Oh my. <laughs> you could simply have asked. The Lord does not ask, he expects. Hence, they hit us on the head with the cross. Okay, now listen to me. She helped me woozily to my feet. If you, find an, an, if you find an automaton whose shard is engraved with a soul on your travels, 
send a telegram to us. We have our own receiving station here. We will reward you materially if that is your wish. But we must have such a well, we must but we must have such a shard. As you say, sister, I agreed, wishing to make good my escape. I'll inform you at once. I have faith, the nun said calmly. Then she let me go. I did not know what to make of the sist of sister Panimalar and her order of artificer nuns then, and I, did not, and I did not know now. I admit I was glad to know we would be leaving Madras and its walls and fortifications and secrets. Now this, is part, this whole thing is part of a much larger event chain, by the way. So finding that automaton is quite the adventure. And uh, I'm not sure we can do that, actually, because it has some prerequisites, I recall. And that's also the case with a lot of these adventures you have in the various towns. Just so you know. Okay, we can't really do anything. Well, let's plan the route. We can go south to Colombo. By airship. Or we can go north to Voltaire. What about... If we can go all the way... Can we go all the way to Calcutta? Yes, we can. Can we get into Chittagong from there? Don't recall. Okay, fine. Let's see. Um, that could be adjusted. That's fine. What about this one? Negotiate. Two thousand pounds. Then we'll leave tomorrow. That's why we need money. We'll do that. That's a lot of money. So we basically pay 2,000 for two days of save, saved travel time. As night fell, uh, let's see, I, uh, let's see, I went out to explore a little. I very much enjoyed the time away from Monsieur Fogg. When I returned, I felt in much finer fettle. Much finer fettle. So many words I've never encountered here. Oh, not the hotel. We already spent the night, right? Depart. The very expensive trip to Calcutta. On board we go. Aboard the Western Flower steamship. It was not until the Western Flower left the shore of India that I truly relaxed and was convinced the sisters of Didacus were not going to bang my <laughs> me over the head once again. Here, on the open water, I began to consider their strange mission and my part in it. Let's see, converse. Uh, I want to go. Yeah, that's already the route we know about. From Chittagong to Manila. Uh, what about Manila? Ooh, the Manila Acapulco Galleon trade has been replaced by airships. So that is another trade route, I would suspect. Another. Route. Travel route. Maybe. I think we already know it, actually. Oh, yeah, I zoomed out, didn't I? Uh, the water was calm and crystal clear beneath our prow. Um, I took a turn about the ship to familiarize myself with her and the other passengers. The flower was a passenger liner. And, but one used by the middle classes and business people, traveling the coast and making traders between, trades between south and north. Hmm. I fell into conversation with the ship's navigator, who leant out over the rail with a hilariously distended telescope, assuring me he would see all the way to, into Rangoon. <laughs> Surely the curvature of the earth prevents such a view. I pointed out, unwilling to be deceived by one such as this. The man smiled. My telescope is not just long, he answered. It is also bent and so can see around the curve. <laughs> uh, I thought his answer quite mad, but saw no reason to tell him. He seemed quite convinced of his own mind. Onwards the ship goes. Uh, let's converse again. Let's see. Oh, darn it. Uh... <laughs> oh, yeah, I can converse with these items. Penny dreadful.
That actually improved relations. Good. Talk about Cal Calcutta. Uh, talk about Singapore. Okay, very good. On the second day, we reached the port of Voltaire. I stood by the rail with the navigator, who was scanning the land through his telescope. Suddenly, he seemed to jump and snap the glass away. Be grateful you're not going ashore here, he remarked darkly, but would not say no, would say, would say no more about it. It seems you make friends wherever you go, Monsieur Fogg remarked to me wryly later that day. Okay. I guess something bad is happening in Voltaire. Um. Down it. Uh, da, 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 da. Singapore. Singapore to Port Moresby, maybe? Singapore to Brisbane? No. Well, again, Mr. Fogg. Okay, fine. Um, leather races. <laughs> well, at least we got, the, got him a few points better in, health, in better health. And all the money we made in the in Europe is still very good. It was still £10,000 up from our starting funds. We made good time up the coast of India, enjoying the rolling of the waves and the glorious thick scents from the kitchens. It, seems, it seemed it was traditional on board to hold a banquet for lunch on the final day. We enjoyed ourselves thoroughly uh, and all but rolled down the gangplank into Calcutta. And we're, we're gonna arrive so late that we're not gonna be able to do much. Um, yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna sell that. Uh, the other ones, that's Chittagong. Uh, um, cowboy boots. Okay, American wardrobe. Let's go for that, I suppose. Um, Rest and recuperation. Let's buy that. And I'm gonna keep the just two boxes. That's fine. Uh, darn it, and it's too late to explore now. Though we don't need, really need it, do we? We're gonna go to Chittagong. Oh, three days, huh? Let's negotiate. That's expensive. That's fine. It's gonna shave off two days. It's expensive. Calcutta was an industrial city which had been built which had built its wealth on opium, textiles and indigo. But that was not to say it was uncultured. <laughs> the chai, chai shops which I passed by uh, were all thronged with affluent babus and behengis, behengis, discussing poetry and literature and the sticky subject of Indian independence. It seemed there was discontent brewing in several places, and I wondered if we would be able to avoid all consequences of it. Where is the most dangerous right now? I asked, and a woman nodded. I hear the mountains to the east are teeming with separatists, <coughs> she declared. They mean to attack Chittagong. I returned quickly to Monsieur Fogg. This is unfortunate. We want to go to Chittagong. But we're gonna risk it. Nothing bad can happen, right? Let's go. Nothing bad can possibly happen when we travel, right? We boarded the SS Thunder of the Abcar shipping line on its way to Hong Kong via Singapore. Uh, but the smokestacks barely had time to steam off their morning dew before we were approaching Chittagong to pick up more, some more laborers. We made a full stop. Oh, and I have choice to just hide on board. We disembarked and made our way into town. So the game is trying to keep me away from Chittagong. For good reason. And But I wanted to go here so I can sell the bolt of silk. Yeah, it's, that's fine. Um, Yokohama, Canton, Batavia. I don't know if we're going to go through those towns. 
Can we go with this? Why not some loaded dice? That's fine. Don't think we're gonna head on heading out on the open road, but hey, why not? Just to fill in the fill in the stuff, and then we're gonna explore. A new route north. Chittagong had been under British control for over a hundred years, but I still, but still, I felt the hostility of the Bengalis as they fetched our bags, served our tea, and smiled. Uh, Monsieur Fogg remained char characteristically ignorant, characteristically ignorant of their anger. There we go. It had probably not occurred to him that his porters were even capable of such feelings. It was an odd sensation to be hated so impersonally, and so I took pains to be courteous to the natives of the city, but it had little effect on the tam tamped down rage nestled in the corners of their mouths. More prosaically, we had been instructed uh, to visit the visa office. Um, okay. But I decided against it. The faces of the locals put my exploratory spirit to bed, and we stayed quite firmly near the train station. A lucky decision, as within the, an hour there had been an explosion from the west of the city. Oh my. Um. <laughs> uh, I w went to investigate. It did not take me long to find the epicenter of the trouble. It seemed a group of revolutionaries were attempting to cut off Chittagong entirely. We were trapped. And the city would, I feared, soon be ablaze. Okay, that's bad. That's a slight uh, problem. But there is a trip here. Monastic Caravan. Tomorrow before 1pm. So, we'll have to wait for a day. So yeah, the game did warn us, but I wanted to go here and sell stuff. Bad decision. Really bad decision. Okay, night time at Chittagong was not quiet. As soon as the sun went down, the streets echoed with shouts and cries, the stirring of revolution. Um. Oh my. But there was no choice except to explore. We, re we needed options to leave. The streets were in chaos, uh, through a screen of grey smoke and terror. Oh my. I saw a young man pick up a stone and throw it at one of the British officers. The officer slumped over and quick, and quick as thought um, his companion raised his revolver and shot the boy. The boy's mother, sister, screamed and the crowd erupted. I saw nothing but... Hmm. The revolver, the revolver wielding officer's face. He was but a boy himself, lips bloodless, eyes wide with horror, even as he shook out, shook out his revolver and loaded another round into the chamber. Someone knocked me from behind, and I spun about, looking into the face of a man in a white kurta about to bring the butt of an antique-looking ma ma matchlock rifle down on the unprotected neck of a British soldier. I leapt forward to save the man, pushing him clear of the rifle butt. He rolled with natural athleticism, and while I was still untangling my limbs, he managed to stagger up to his feet and shoot his assailant in the stomach. It was unbearably gruesome. And, and I will readily, readily admit that I may never eat a rare steak again. The soldier seized me by the shoulders and pulled me to my feet. No time to daydream, boyo, he advised, in a lilting Welsh accent. He shoved through the crowd with no little violence. Stay close. As a repayment for saving his life, the soldier, who introduced himself as Llewellyn, escorted me back to my lodgings. Looks like you're going to be here for a while, he remarked. The railway's burned, uh, and we're be we'll be closing the port and setting up pickets to catch the revolutionaries. 
But we must leave, I insisted. In a hurry, are you? He scratched his head, his beard. My regiment's uh, lighting out for Impal uh, for reinforcements. I suppose you can come with us if you're in a tearing rush. Uh, I thanked him profusely and dusted myself off. Uh, with, fastidious with, with fastidious thoroughness before giving my report of the day's events to Monsieur Fogg. So now we have another option. And I'm just going to click here to pause. So now we have a choice. We can go with the uh, military up to Impal. Darn it, it didn't pause. Um, oops. There we go. Or we can go with the monastic caravan, which departs immediately. Uh, da, 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 come on, come on, come on. Is that 9 p.m.? Oh, it was 1 p.m. Okay, we're gonna go with them. I think I'd rather go with them rather than the military. Because there are some nasty events up in Impal. I have played the game before. <laughs> Let's see, put it like that. The British army had closed down Chittagong's port and set up pickets which prevented travelers from leaving the city. Luckily for us, the colonial governor had made an exception for monks on their way to the Burmese royal capital of Yadab, oh my goodness, Yadanabon for the fifth Buddhist synod. Uh, a sensible decision given by the uprising interfering with the peaceful monks' religious practice would only inflame the unrest further and perhaps even push the tense British relations with the Kingdom of Burma into yet another war. Uncharacteri uncharacteristically, it was my master rather than I who had convinced the monks to grant us passage with them. I confess myself surprised by the magnificence of their transport, a small fleet of carriages drawn by pairs of gilded leoglyphs, uh, shints, which belched, belched, ugh, which belched steam from their jaws. I glanced at my master as we settled into our seats. We will travel in style, I remarked. A dry laugh interrupted whatever response Monsieur Fogg was about to make, as a Burmese monk of middle years climbed in. The carriages were sent by the king of Burma. They do not belong to us, he explained. We began to jolt our way out of the city. We own no material goods. Then how do you feed and clothe yourself? Um, I wondered aloud. Monsieur Fogg stiffened slightly beside me, no doubt thinking my open query rude. We find that people are generous, he allowed, and we are not averse to hard labor. And so, with such conversation, we left the burning town of Chittagong behind us. Miss Mademoiselle the driver. <laughs> um, let's talk about Yabdabon. That's fine. We can go to Ragoon. From Ragoon we can go to Manila maybe. Uh, yeah, that's fine. We are Ragoon. Uh, to Singapore maybe. Not journeys we already... Not journeys we didn't know, apparently. The monks in our carriage began to chant in Sanskrit as the monk, as the sun moved across the sky. I... <laughs> listened, captivated by the words, by the sound, that only felt quiet when our carriage drew to a halt in the royal city of Yad, Yadanabon. My goodness, I can never can't say that thing. Yadanaban, overlooked by the hill of Mandalay. Okay, so now we're there. There's no market here. Uh, we can plan our next route down to Rangoon. Whatever it was, depart tomorrow, 8 a.m. What was it called? The... The Hyde Chint. Okay, fine. So that's whatever these beasties that we just traveled on are. Okay. Spending the night here. Let's see now. Yadanabon was thronged with Buddhist monks and believers who had flooded the city to attend the fifth Buddhist synod. They meditated, conversed and drank endless cups of tea in the many, many free travelers' shelters, Zayats, of the royal capital. 
Uh, I went looking for transportation, locating a rack of chintz for hire outside one of the Zayats. Where do you head? I asked, and the driver shrugged. South or north? Where to? Pangsao, Rangoon, he shrugged. Where do you want to go? <laughs> London! He nodded. That's quite far. Indeed so, I replied, and I turned to leave, when the smell of cooking distracted me. I approached and fell into conversation with one of the cooks in a nearby Zayat, who was stirring a vast pot of glass noodles in chicken broth uh, flavored with lime leaves and coconut. Okay, aren't Buddhists vegetarian? I inquired, watching her add sliced up royal roast pork to her cooking pot. What? She looked at me blankly. We are followers of the Theravada school. The monks are only forbidden to consume the flesh of the human, elephant, horse, dog, cat, lion, tiger, bear, leopard, and slug. <laughs> that is quite a list. She gave me a sharp smile. It is a very thorough religion, she sighed heavily. Now, are you going to stand there, or are you going to help me serve this meal? Of course, madame. We had we fed perhaps 50 monks and travelers over the next hour. It was hard labor. Uh, but, but, at, but at the end of it, I felt a true spirit of camaraderie. The cook gave me two bowls of flavorsome noodle broth as reward, and I took them home to my master. A nourishing meal was not something to be turned down on our travels. So that improved his health. That's good. And now we got an option to go north rather than south. But I think we're gonna go to the south. Onwards. On the hide chin. I'm gonna see if we can get back to on the onto the sea routes. But that will have to happen next time. It is time for a short break. Thank you for watching.